All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining. This is our second of our two March uh, PO call options. Our agenda for today is we're gonna look at some of the responses to the patient empowerment toolkit concerns that we had shared with JMB based on you, all, you all's feedback. Um, we'll look at some updates with regards to meetings, um, some recruitment updates, and then finally kind of closing out as we, we do with some uh, reminders and housekeeping items. So first, with regards to the Patient Empowerment Toolkit, like I said, we did share that feedback that we received from all the POs with JMB um, to try to address as many of the challenges uh, that we can, make sure that it's as an efficient uh, procedure to prescribing the toolkit as it can be. So um, we wanted to share some of these responses back with you. So um, this is a summary of some of the concerns that we received from uh, you guys. Uh, these included difficulties with communication or connecting to a representative at JMB, the processing time taking a long time, uh, patients uh, getting contacted uh, or difficulties with uh, contact with patients um, with regards to late calls or uh, calls not being received. Uh, getting no feedback from JMB as to what the status of the order is or if a patient is not eligible, and then uh, on issues with regards to submitting the order in general. So uh, this is a summary of the concerns of, with regards to the eligibility. So uh, avail availability, um, which is the Blue Cross uh, uh, system, uh, is frustrating to use. They would that you guys would prefer a list of eligible patients sent to you guys, and that the PDCM list is often inaccurate. Uh, some other uh, concerns that we received were uh, related to wanting to get sent uh, results directly. Um, and so working on uh, uh, partnering with JMB and HNC to make that happen currently. Um, we're hoping to uh, try to integrate some of the data from the three in one bundle devices, the CGM, the blood pressure monitor and the weight scale directly into EMRs in the near future. Um, and uh, we're, we will be starting with Epic um, if we're able to continue and operationalize this uh, project, but we would then uh, hope to expand to additional um, uh, EMRs in the near future. Um, I'm seeing come in the chat. I provide some feedback that I have received from clinical staff on the issues presented today on JMB are not exclusive to the patient and toolman. Yes. Uh, yeah, so we we know that there has been, and we've heard uh, that sim similar sentiment than from, from lots of folks that a lot of the issues that, that folks have had with JMB have been in the past as well. Um, and that has to do with uh, other operating procedures or other experiences that uh, have been uh, had with JMB with regards to prescribing either CGMs or other medical devices through them. Um, and so in this uh, slideshow that we're going through today, we'll talk about a little bit about how the three in one bundle is separated um, from other ordering from JMB, um, including a separate dedicated phone line and some other ways that JMB has tried to um, create a little bit of a delineation between the patient empowerment toolkit and all other orders that go through them. But thanks, Lindsay, for that. Um, all right. Uh, so, so these are some of the responses to the concerns with regards to the difficulty in contacting and communicating with a representative at JMB. So like I just alluded to, there is a dedicated phone line now specific to the patient empowerment toolkit. Um, and so that will be dedicated to ordering or providers uh, that are ordering this um, toolkit. So that you, when you call this number on the bottom of this slide here, the individual that answers the phone will be very aware of the patient empowerment toolkit and will be able to help answer questions specific to it. This number should only be used for the patient empowerment toolkit though. Um, if you have questions about, about ordering other devices that are not related to the patient empowerment toolkit, you would go through their normal um, contact numbers. Um, and uh, we've received feedback from, from uh, um, JMB that up until today, they've received uh, less than five applicable calls to this number. So we're, we're all hoping that it becomes a little bit more useful um, to you guys and are, you're, you're able to utilize it. Um, and that should help get faster responses to your questions. Um, we are gonna share that up, uh, that we did share, I should say that number in our newsletter that went out uh, today, um, and then uh, again, sharing it with you all today so that you can uh, share it with your participating providers. With regards to long processing time, so uh, processing times are typically uh, due to challenges in getting in touch with patients. So um, we do know that sometimes patients don't always recognize the phone number associated with 
uh, JMB giving them a call. Um, and then uh, we wanted to clarify some of the next, like the workflow associated with uh, JMB contacting patients. So if a patient is contacted on a first attempt, the toolkit is usually shipped to that patient within 48 hours after that referral is received. Um, and then uh, there's oftentimes challenges related to the those patient delays, getting forms from the patients filled out and getting the patient set up on LibreView, which is a necessity in order for this toolkit to be able to be mailed out to them. Um, and so uh, the next steps, we will share communication requesting that providers notify patients that they'll receive a call specifically from JNB within five days after getting that um, referral sent over so that they know that they should be answering and responding to calls um, from either unknown numbers or from JNB. Um, another thing that can be done is uh, a patient can, uh, if they get a call from JNB and they miss it because they don't know it's in a uh, JNB, if they get a phone uh, voicemail, they, uh, the patient can put that number in their phone um, so that they know next time the JMB calls that that is JMB and that they should be answered. So with regards to contact with patients here, I kind of started talking a little bit about this here, um, but uh, we wanted to kind of address some of the callback time issues as well. Um, so we did clarify with JMB that uh, patients do have an option to submit information digitally. Um, they are told that they can receive that information they need to complete via email or via the JMB online portal. Um, and that's up to the patient's uh, uh, preference. Um, and so JMB also shared that their callback times that they try to contact a patient are typically, not typically, they are between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Um, but if they receive outreach from patients, they try to make sure that they get called back um, within a certain time frame. And so in those circumstances, they may call a patient slightly later than 8 p.m. Um, next steps for that, we will notify providers at the regional meetings uh, about the uh, communication standards from JMB and the options for patients, uh, the, the options that patients have for submitting their information. Uh, with regards to feedback from JMB, so POs reported not hearing if a patient was able to receive the toolkit. So um, JMB did let us know that they call the patient and the prescriber to let them know that they were not eligible and also send a letter, uh, a JMB unable to service letter to the provider that states the reason for the patient being uh, ineligible and for them being unable to distribute the toolkit to the patient. Um, again, we'll notify providers at the regional meetings about this process, let them know um, the JMB will call both them and the patient to let them know that they were ineligible and then also send that letter with regards to the reasons for why they were ineligible. Um, with regards to issues submitting a prescription, um, we had reports of difficulty submitting the prescriptions or having to submit it multiple times to get it go through. Um, JMB reported back to us that they believe that this should not um, uh, uh, excuse me, JMB believe this could be one of a few things, but um, that uh, it could be a transmission issue on either the fax end or a transmission issue on the receiving end. Um, they said that they've occasionally not received a fax or two um, or incomplete form that was submitted that needed additional information. Um, if, if a form is submitted that doesn't have the necessary contact information, uh, they won't be able to reach back out to let, know, let um, the prescriber or the patient know that they weren't able to fill the order. Um, so oops, please do let us know. Please do let us know if you uh, continue to have issues with submitting a prescription um, or if you notice specific instances where a prescription has been sent in but you have not received a response. If we have very specific details on a specific instance and we'll be able to backtrack that and understand more what went wrong and try to um, create uh, a workflow to prevent that from happening again in the future. All right, so the next issue that we had heard about was the determining of PDCM eligibility. Um, and so we know that availT has uh, some difficulties with being used or that it's inaccurate or that it's too much work to determine eligibility. Um, there were some suggestions about Blue Cross Blue Shield sending a letter to eligible patients or otherwise notifying folks that they're eligible and then asking them to ask their providers for it. Blue Cross suggested one other route um, prescribing the toolkit to patients uh, and letting JMB determine PDCM eligibility instead of the prescriber trying to determine in advance. So we've provided, there are these options available to you in the PDCM list, but if those 
options fail or they become too cumbersome. Um, a discussion with the patient could occur where the provider says, um, I think that you may be eligible for this toolkit, but I'm not, we're not totally sure. We're going to try to submit it, but there's not a guarantee that you'll be eligible, but you will get contacted by JMB letting you know either way. Um, so that's always an option. Um, so just kind of thinking about how to reframe the talking uh, of the conversation that the provider has with the patient around the prescribing of the toolkit. So this is the referral process. So I'm actually gonna switch over to um, a different screen here so they can show this in a little bit more detail. Um, so this is the, the referral process and how it kind of works in a flow diagram sense. So if we zoom in here, we can start with the referral received. So like we had talked about, you can fax that over um, uh, and then uh, that gets sent over to the uh, patient empowerment toolkit team. So if the referral is processed, uh, in order for the referral to be processed, a patient has to set up their new account, their insurance has to be verified, and uh, the prescription would be then be processed. If for some reason they are unable to service, uh, these reasons include the insurance coverage is, is uh, not correct, the patient doesn't have PCM benefits, or they aren't a Blue Cross commercial patient, um, if the patient doesn't respond to JMB following up with, them, up with them about getting set up with their necessary accounts or getting them the documentation signed and sent back in, or if they're unable to contact the patient or the provider based on the information or contact details that were provided on the prescription, then this would be an area where they would be unable to proceed. If they're able to proceed past the referral process, um, we get the able to service uh, status here, meaning the patient is eligible to be able to receive the toolkit. Um, if uh, if there are two uh, possible outcomes here, the first being the most desirable, the complete prescription, um, JMB will contact the patient, confirm program enrollment, let them uh, know that they are eligible and that they will be receiving the toolkit. Um, they'll uh, verify uh, their enrollment in LibreView and complete all of the demos with the patient. Um, and they must obtain the patient's email in order to do that. That's vital. Um, and then the patient will receive uh, the member packet as well. If there are issues with regards to completing that step, um, this could be um, a fax back to the provider. Um, they will contact the patient to confirm uh, that they were eligible, but they are missing some form of information. Um, and like say, they will uh, follow up with the patient to try to obtain out each part of that information that was missing uh, until that uh, is completed and received. Um, all right. If for some reason the patient does not respond or they do not follow up with JMB within the follow-up timeframe, um, which is three uh, uh, follow-up attempts, um, then there would be an unable to service status for that as well. Um, all right, so after the unable, uh, after the able to service, if the prescription was complete from the provider and they have all the necessary information, um, the JMB team would then be able to uh, complete the LibreView enrollment, which they would again try three attempts to complete with the patient. And then the order processing would begin with regards to shipping the devices and uh, all of the necessary uh, packet information to the patients. So moving on here. Any questions or comments on the feedback with regard to the patient empowerment toolkit before we move on to meeting updates? All right. Um, so spring 2024 regional. Oh, I have one comment in the chat. Hang on a second. Oh, oh it's Jack. All right. So um with regards to our spring 2024 regional meeting registration, so that is now open. Um, you and your clinical practice clinician champions uh, uh, should have received emails with that registration information. I'm gonna address one comment in the chat here. I had a patient make me aware that they needed to subscribe to some internet things databases when getting and using the toolkit. So I'm guessing based on the use of the term databases that that's referring to LibreView. Uh, LibreView is the system that allows patients' CGM data to be collected by their CGM and turned into CGM reports. Um, that is a that system is not unique to the three in one bundle. Um, it's the same system that's used for folks that are prescribed to CGM through the traditional pharmacy benefit. Um, but that's a part of the enrollment in the patient empowerment toolkit is getting the patient set up with that. 
I anticipate that's what the patient was referring to. Not sure who is using the data. It was not connect. So the data, uh, yeah, so the data that is associated with the toolkit does flow back through um, the, like how we talked about how we're trying to get that data to flow back to your medical record system. So in addition to just connecting to their provider, that data flows back to MCTTD um, so that we can provide those services where we're able to incorporate the patient empowerment toolkit data both into our patient data dashboards as well as through what we talked about about the automatic EMR integration. So that may be what we were referring to then. No one else besides MCTTD and you as the providers would have access to that. Okay, um, so back to the spring regional meetings here. Um, PCPs, endocrinologists, and nephrologists are all expected to attend uh, for the spring regional meetings, including endocrinology and nephrology practices that joined this year. Um, you can check who is registered and unregistered for the meeting in the administrative portal. Um, there's a link on that homepage that says, click here to view practices who have not yet registered for the spring 2024 regional meeting. Um, that link allows you to see those clinical champions who have not yet registered. Just a reminder, uh, we are, we, as a part of the PO scorecard, um, we do ask that you guys have all of your clinical champions registered at least three weeks in advance of their meeting. Um, so please make sure to go into the admin portal and double check that. All right, so this is our uh, agenda for the spring regional meetings. Um, we're going to start with, uh, as usual, some welcomes and updates um, from our program directors. We'll have a about 30 minute talk on updates from endocrinology and nephrology led by um, MCTTD content expert uh, leads uh, Dr. Mike Hung, nephrology, and Dr. Radhika Papasui, endocrinology. Um, we'll then have about a 10 minute break. And then we're going to have a breakout session from 7 to 7.45, where we'll split up the PCPs, nephrologists, and endocrinologists and have their respective leads uh, lead their breakout sessions, focusing on um, the QI initiatives of this round's EDR cycles, including for the nephrology and endocrinologists, partnering with primary care practices um, for the care coordination component of their VBR, and then doing a QI discussion with the PCPs. Uh, to close out the meeting, we'll have a brief discussion from 7.45 to 8, 8 o'clock to bring us to the end uh, about some future uh, objectives as NCTCD and looking ahead to 2025. So um, with regards to the fall regional meetings, um, we will be notifying clinical champions uh, of virtual regional meetings next week, including the dates and the expectations that we outlined in last month's uh, PO call with regards to um, engagement. Um, we will be combining some of these regions so that we host a total of four meetings since these are virtual. Um, the first meeting uh, will be for, on Wednesday, uh, October 23rd from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, the intention will be for the attendees for that will be uh, the folks that normally attend Blue Jay and Bluegill region meetings. Um, if you do need to substitute meetings though, that is completely okay. Just reach out to us and let us know. Uh, the second meeting will be intended for the Badger, Ann Arbor, and Gray Wolf of Kalamazoo regions. Um, and that meeting will be on Tuesday, the 29th from 6 to 8. The third meeting um, will be intended for the Black Bear region on the 6th of November. And the fourth meeting intended for Bay City and Traverse City on Thursday, November 14th. The June collaborative wide meeting um, will be held on Friday, June 7th from 12 to 5 p.m. Um, MCTTD's uh, collaborative wide meeting will be taking uh, place in partnership with Inhale again at the Lansing Community College, same place as it was last year. Inhale will have the morning section this year from 8 to 12. Lunch will be from 12 to 1, and then we will take over for MCTTD's portion beginning at 1 um, until we are adjourn at 5 p.m. Um, some topics will include health equity, pre-diabetes, and supporting quality improvement and implementation. Um, and then registration for this will open in early April. Um, uh, do uh, just remember that attendance at the meeting by a PO administrative contact and PO clinical champion is required as part of the MCTTB PO scorecard. All right.
right, talking a little bit here about our recruitment updates. So the new POs that are joining MCTTD in 2024 are Novello and IHA. So we're very excited to have them on board. Um, with regards to primary care practice recruitment, um, that is open through uh, April 19th. Um, we do have space to bring on 75 practices. Um, you can nominate practices in the administrative portal um, to be a uh, participating practice. So um, your eligible practices will be shown on the portal when you log in um, and just click on PCP practice recruitment on the left-hand sidebar and you'll be able to see those practices. Um, following April 19th, we will report out the total number of applicants that we received and begin evaluating based on the criteria that we discussed a couple months ago on the January video call. Um, we did have our intro to MCTTD for practices uh, webinar take place this past Monday, the 11th, um, and we'll share uh, the slides out uh, with folks if you haven't already received them. A few reminders and announcements. So uh, the MCTTD annual report is now live. It is available via the link here on the slides. You guys should have all received the slides for today's call. Um, that is available both in a uh, PDF brief form and a full interactive form on our website. So we encourage you to check that out. Um, that did go out as well in the learning community newsletter that went out this morning. So uh, assuming you're subscribed to that, check that out. Um, uh, thank you for all of your hard work over the past uh, year. It was absolutely amazing to be able to highlight all of the accomplishments that we did together um, and feature so many of you guys in that annual report. Um, we're really proud uh, to review and, and look back on all that we've accomplished together. All right, so a uh, quick reminder on uh, um, specialist VBR here, and thanks Noah for putting the annual report in the chat. On, uh, so quick reminder here on uh, continuing specialist VBR, so uh, specialists that have already been enrolled. Um, so one of the requirements for cohorts one and two is to identify that primary care practice department with, like we just talked about, um, we would have that breakout session at the regional meetings to discuss further. There is now a place in the admin portal where this can be submitted. So if you click on the SCP PCP partnership button on the left-hand sidebar, uh, you will get the um, uh, form at the bottom of this slide here. And so this is where you'll be able to enter your uh, specialist uh, practices and your PCP practice partnerships so that you can make sure that that form is submitted and finalized. Um, then it'll be documented in your admin portal. All right, so a couple of upcoming learning community events. Uh, tomorrow or uh, Thursday, um, that date is incorrect. Thursday, March 14th. Um, we will be having a uh, learning community event led by Dr. Jonathan Gavison. Again, that's tomorrow, not the 16th, uh, tomorrow, Thursday, the 14th, from 12 to 1 p.m. Um, and that will be focused on what's new in ADA 2024 guidelines. So Dr. Gavison will be walking through all the updates to the 2024 IDEA guidelines and what changed versus the 2023 guidelines. Um, and then Friday, uh, April 26th, um, we will be having our next one led by Dr. Tina Grazda, uh, focusing on guiding low and very low carbohydrate diets with CGM. Um, and just as a reminder, attendance at the live sessions does qualify um, for CME um, and meeting your learning community VBR credit. Um, and then watching the recorded session um, is and completing the post test is uh, also an option for getting VBR, but there is no CME um, offered for, for watching the recorded sessions. Um, the referral to specialist webinar available yet? Uh, I believe so. I think it was just put up yesterday. Jackie, can, can you confirm that um, in the chat if possible? If what was put up yesterday, sorry, I missed that. The, the referral to specialist webinar, has that been made live yet? I think it went up yesterday. Yes, it is. I will link it in the chat right now. Thank you. All right. Quick reminder on BBR requirements here. So there are less than three months left uh, to meet all BBR. Um, and so do please reach out and remind your physicians and practices of this requirement. And so you can look in your admin portal to see uh, which practices and which physicians have met their requirements and which have not, um, so that you can do some directed outreach. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and open it up to any questions.
that. Well, thank you all. Um, we'll turn it over to inhale now. Um, Sean, are you reading it from your side? I am. Thank you, sir. All right. All right, just give everyone a couple of minutes to transition over and then we'll we'll get started. And just to confirm, can everyone see my screen? Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right, uh, we will go ahead and, and get going. Um, so thank you very much for joining. This is our second uh, March PO monthly call. Um, go through our agenda for today. Uh, we're gonna go through announcements and updates. We're gonna touch base on our new toolkit that we're rolling out on our website um, and give some feedback on that. Uh, we'll discuss spring regional meetings. Uh, we'll go through PCP recruitment. Uh, we, we will touch on the 2024 data, uh, data dashboard updates, uh, review executive committee recruitment. Uh, we'll touch on the lung learning labs registration and then we'll have some time for questions and discussion. Uh, we will be monitoring the chat. Um, so if you do have any questions, please feel free to uh, put those in the chat and or come off your um, your mute and ask them as well. All right, announcements and updates. Uh, so MOC interest, again, we're gonna be, uh, have a project that's gonna be kicking off in April, uh, focused on inhale education, uh, our inhale education measure. Um, to obtain our level of interest, we are still looking. Uh, we've received feedback from uh, a couple of you so far, but um, all, still asking for each PO to email uh, inhale at support, um, uh, that you must add you for the number of physicians and or physician assistants that may be interested. Uh, we will also send out a detailed email um, later this month and or early um, in April to kind of review the specifics behind that. So that is uh, that's still coming. Uh, cost sharing. So we were asked by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan uh, to discuss cost sharing within inhaler education as we've received numerous inquiries regarding coverage and bills for uh, things like inhaler education from patients, as well as some concerns uh, from providers and the POs. Um, Blue Cross's response is that they recommend discussing with the patients that there is cost sharing involved with high deductible copay co plans. Uh, we do know that about 40% of patients have high deductible plans, and that sometimes with the patients, we do have to look at the fact that their formulary uh, may not actually be Blue Cross Blue Shield or with Blue Cross Blue Shield commercial. So uh, trying to make uh, sure that the education is covered by all patients will be very challenging. Um, so it is important to have that discussion with their patients and make sure that they understand that there could be a cost associated with that. Uh, a quick note um, for specialist VBR letters. Uh, that was actually, there was a email sent out this morning. Uh, so please uh, make sure to disseminate that, those down to uh, the inhale participating specialists and contact the coordinating center if you have any questions about that. Uh, all right, our inhaler education toolkit. So uh, like I previously said, it's actually on our main uh, page on our website under toolkits. We've got a couple sections there so far for inhaler education toolkit and a tobacco cessation toolkit. Uh, but inhale and our education work group has curated an inhaler education toolkit to assist providers giving uh, education to patients regarding proper inhaler techniques. Um, so some of the resources have included uh, dosed uh, charts and guidance, action plans and questionnaires, billing assistance, uh, and patient education flyers and inhaler te technique videos. 
Um, so the behind this, we understand that the toolkits might not contain everything that is needed during a patient visit. And obviously, please feel free to supplement with your own tools as necessary. Uh, we're also looking for additional uh, suggestions that you may have um, or best practices as well. Um, so we are, again, still working on including more resources in the tobacco cessation toolkit specifically, um, but providers are welcome to access it now. Uh, but again, please note that the additional tools will be added soon. So if you have any other questions about that feedback, please let us know. All right, 2024 spring regional meetings are quickly approaching. Uh, it's somehow March and almost 70 degrees outside, which I'll take, uh, but we've got uh, those meetings are going to be held virtually on May 7th, May 8th, May 14th, and May 15th. Uh, and just as a quick note, uh, we are aware that MCT2D um, also has a meeting on May 8th, and we are working to ensure our regions don't conflict for that day. Uh, specific requirements to earn a BBR. Um, again, we want, want, want to make sure that this is a very interactive session because this is going to be a trial basis. Uh, for 2024. And again, it's not guaranteed for 25, but some key things that, that we're going to need uh, are the your cameras on, uh, participation in breakouts and Q&A sessions, um, acknowledgement of participation expectations. And then we may um, ask that you um, download an app like Kahoot or Pull Everywhere prior to that. And then Regional meeting dates and registration opens on March 11th, um, sorry, two days ago. Invitations were sent out uh, based on region uh, and that will be done via the admin portal. So if you did not see that or have any, have any other questions, please let us know. Uh, PCP recruitment, uh, recruitment open on February 15th. Um, you can add additional practices and PCPs until April 29th. Couple notes on that. It must be PGIP eligible and PCMH designated. Uh, and just a couple other notes on this. You, uh, they have to be added to the inhales admin portal. Um, they can begin earning VBR beginning 9-1 of 24. And this is for the measurement period beginning 9-1 um, 24 for the 2025 VBR. A uh, couple notes about that. Um, the practice clinical champions have to attend the fall 24 regional meeting. Uh, they also have to attend the spring 25 regional meeting. And then there is a, the inhale medication training module that must be completed. Uh, and then other participation requires uh, requirements um, as outlined. You can find those on our website as well or reach out with any additional questions. And then meet the PO performance VBR measure as well. Um, adding PCPs to the admin portal. Um, so a quick um, quick note on this. So when you log into the admin portal, um, you're just going to go and click on PCP recruitment. You can search or scroll to the practice you would like, and then you're just going to simply click nominate. Um, please complete the 2024 PCP recruitment app application, and then all you do is hit, hit submit. Um, inhale will be reviewing submissions and approve um, in those in the admin portal. And again, as always, if you have any technical um, issues or difficulties, you can uh, email inhale-support at med.umich.edu uh, and we will help you promptly. All right, practice uh, survey assessments. Um, so those are at all also now available uh, for practices to, uh, to complete um, and uh, there is going to be a assigned as a task to all current practices. It, it is visible on the dashboard and the task screens. Um, so if you experience technical issues, again, feel free to email us and we will help triage those. Uh, 2024 da uh, data dashboard. So some updates on the data release schedule. Uh, so March 8th, 24, uh, there was uh, the release and that data was through December of 23. Uh, the next one will be May 1st, and that data will be through uh, 24. The May 1st release uh, is to include new data vi visualization of data trends. So we're excited about that. Hopefully that, that, will, uh, that will help. Um, the other ones after that are going to be June 26th. The data will be from uh, data through uh, March 24. Uh, following that, 9-25-24, data will be through 6-24. And then 11, 14, 24 data will be through 824. Um, so keep an eye on that. 
Uh, Inhale will provide supplemental data reports to POs for individualized performances, ranking charts, et cetera. So uh, we're trying to provide um, additional information um, and uh, items for you to be able to utilize as well. All right, some additional information on here. Um, we do have a new radio button um, added to allow users to choose from all PCP or um, for all PCP or specialist. Um, so you can see it over there on the top right when you uh, log into the admin portal. Uh, measure, it's, you're going to find that measure medians will automatically change based on the filter selected. Uh, measure medians are calculated separately for PCP and specialty provider groups. Uh, so allergist pulmonologist. Um, if a PO has both PCPs and specialists, the median for the selected specialty type will display. An overall measure median is also calculated for both specialty types combined. Um, if a PO has only PCPs and no specialists, only the PCP median will display. And if a PO has only specialists, only the specialist median will display. Um, so there are release notes for additional details if you'd like to go through and read those uh, more thoroughly, and those are located in the data dashboard. Uh, executive committee recruitment, uh, just to kind of touch on that. Uh, so again, the vision for the board, um, it's gonna be a committee made up of a col uh, collaborative participants and stakeholders to offer guidance um, on issues such as VBR measures, future measure development, target setting, ongoing analysis of data and trends, and then pertinent information from the frontline provider perspective. Um, just to kind of cover a few highlights, the meeting cadence um, and time uh, requirement. Uh, so they're gonna be quarterly meetings that we're um, currently looking at an hour and a half, and then there'll be ad hoc meetings as needed. Uh, the, the meetings will, um, we'll review the review of data items, proposals, beginning uh, between meetings, uh, approximately that will be um, one hour for, for those specific meetings. Um, and then we're going to have one in-person meeting uh, that's we're to be determined on specific, uh, the specifics behind that date. And then the projected launch date is actually going to be uh, this summer. So uh, keep an eye on that. Um, from a membership perspective, uh, our goal is to have 13 members. Again, we want to have one to two PO administrators, one uh, PharmD, seven clinical champions, uh, four practicing providers from specialties, and then uh, obviously nurses and asthma educators, um, rep uh, representative of our POs, providers, and specialists. So again, we're looking for um, a um, uh, wide range, but we're looking for allergists, pediatricians, pediatric pulmonologists, PharmDs, PCPs, pulmonologists, and then geographic representation of the collaborative, just so we can have a um, uh, we can have a, uh, a further reach. Um, also, recruitment timeline and questions. Uh, so right now, call for nominations opens now through March thirty uh, first. Uh, it's going to be coming up in couple of weeks. Uh, so we're going to review, uh, um, have a review of the nominees um, in April. And then this, that's going to be done by um, the coordinating center uh, that we will uh, do a notification of membership and um, selection uh, in April as well. And then our initial meeting currently, uh, we're targeting June um, 2024. Uh, uh, nominations, uh, you can complete the nomination form on the admin portal. Uh, there is a self, uh, you can do self-nomination or nominate a colleague. Uh, again, the coordinating center will follow up with, with the nominees. And just as a reminder, a uh, bonus VBR point will be rewarded for nomination. Um, and then the ability to provide input on shaping future measures and target settings for the collaborative. So again, we're, we're really trying to uh, get a good collective group um, so we can um, work on our, our future focus. Uh, lung learning labs. Uh, we've actually... We have a lung learning labs presentation tomorrow by Dr. Wahidi. He'll be discussing lung, lung volume reduction. Um, and then as a reminder, uh, pre-registration is required to attend the event. Uh, we do know that some people have had some difficulties with registra registration, but please make sure to contact us as soon as possible if you run into any issues and include the name and email address along with the PO they're participating with. Uh, that way we can get them registered. You will receive a confirmation email, except if we put the information in manually. So we will send you the link out directly for these instances. Um, and also another reminder uh, that if they want to obtain CME, they need to go through Beaumont. 
Um, so keep uh, an eye on that and make sure that that's disseminated down. And then we also next month, uh, we're going to have our spirometry for PCPs. Um, so that will be also upcoming as well. So please uh, tune into that if you are able. Uh, upcoming events uh, next month. So our call date is going to be on April 8th at 11 or April 10th at 2. Uh, our, again, our Lung Learning Lab series is running through April. April, So we're almost to, to the end of that. Um, our collaborative uh, wide for our summer collaborative wide is going to be June 7th in Lansing. Uh, we've got our spring regional meetings. That's going to be again May 7th, 8th, 14th, and 15th. And then our MOC project uh, surrounding inhaler education is going to launch in April 2024. All right, got through all that pretty quickly. Uh, quickly, and I see that there was a message in the chat, um, but I just want to see if there was any other additional questions that anyone had. And April, thank you very much for answering that. All right. Um, well, again, as always, you can feel free to re reach out to us if you have any questions concerning the issues at inhale-support um, at med.umich.edu. Uh, obviously, you can go to our website as well. Uh, we've been, you know, constantly revamping that. Brenda and the team have done a really great job of updating that and uh, trying to enhance a lot of its features. Uh, so please keep an eye on that. You can also uh, reach out to us um, or follow us as well on Instagram um, X. And then if there, you have any technical support with data hub or access concerns, uh, you can reach out to Michigan Data Collaborative at med.umich.edu. And if there are no other questions, then you can get about 15 minutes of your time back. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining. Uh, have a great uh, day. Enjoy the weather. And we will talk to you next month. Thanks.